Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Good afternoon, my name is Tilly Khan. I'm the Mayor of London, standing in for James O'Brien, and I'm really pleased to have Mr. Jeremy Corbyn in the studio. Good afternoon, Jeremy. Good afternoon, Tilly. How are you? Not bad at all. Like, Jer Jeremy, most people don't realise that MPs on a Friday spend their time in, in their patch, and you just had a busy morning in Islington at your uh, well, I've surgery. Just, I've just come from uh, Exeter this morning. I was doing a big event last night in Barnstable in Devon. Came back this morning. I've been in my office in Islington this morning. Um, dealing with casework, housing casework, of course, and uh, then I'm down here to be interviewed by you. Well, thank you for coming in, uh, my, Jeremy. My, my pleasure. Uh, Jeremy, I've got a question I've got to ask you. Um, I mean, I've been asking around canvassing people uh, what questions I should ask you, and a big issue this week uh, is uh, the, the stuff that, you know, Jared O'Mara is, uh, has said and is alleged to have uh, said. Uh, you and I both know as human rights uh, advocates and campaigners of the importance of due process and uh, you know, presumption of uh, innocence, but some of the things that he's accepted, he said, are frankly uh, unacceptable and uh, wrong. Can you, can you explain how you respond as the leader of our party to these uh, serious allegations against uh, this MP? First of all, anybody <coughs> making abusive comments anywhere is unacceptable, completely wrong, and has to be challenged and dealt with. Uh, it became apparent that uh, there was stuff on the internet from Jared Mara that was actually, some bit was quite old, uh, early 2000s, and um, this became, came to light. Uh, he then discussed it and made a very, very full apology to the Parliamentary Labour Party on Monday night, which was uh, actually quite well received. After that, it became apparent that there were also stuff on the internet from much later on than that. And um, on the basis of that, we thought the right thing to do was to suspend his membership of the party and thus of the Parliamentary Labour Party. An investigation is now underway and that will take place and the result will come from that. But behind all this is actually uh, the atmosphere surrounding Harvey Weinstein and what he's done and the atmosphere of abuse of women is a very, very serious one. There has to be a proper system of people being able to report, women particularly being able to report if they've been abused in any way and have it dealt with in a timely and proper manner. Our party, the Labour Party, has a process for doing that, <coughs> both for employees of um, party officials, MPs and councillors, but also for party members who feel that they have been abused in any way. We have a process of dealing with it. The Prime Minister has also announced this morning that she supports, which I agree with her on, a process that... Um, the staff of any MP of any party mm. can and should report these matters to the House of Commons Authority because where there is an unequal power relationship in the workplace and women become vulnerable as a result of it, they have to be supported, they have to be protected. And I say this to every employer that's listening, make sure you've got processes in place that any of your staff that um, feel under threat or are being abused by a more powerful colleague then you have to have a process to deal uh, with uh, it. Jeremy, the light bulbs have lit up with calls on, on housing, universal credit and other issues, but I just want just one more question on, 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 the, on the Sheffield Hallam MP. What's your response to uh, the criticism of our party that we delayed in suspending uh, the, this MP? How, how, what's your response to that? Well, the issue came to light uh, last weekend. It was uh, discussed at the Parliamentary Labour Party on Monday. The later revolution, revelations appeared the following day. He was suspended on Wednesday morning. Jeremy, there's loads of uh, calls that have come in, loads of texts that have uh, come in. That this board is going berserk. But I've got to ask you one more question around housing now. Mm. Uh, you've got experience as an Islington North MP over many, many uh, years about the housing crisis and its impact. Um, one of the things that you've talked about in your conference speech was uh, increased investment in social uh, housing. I've announced today figures which show that we will need, roughly speaking, 66,000 homes a year to meet the needs of Londoners. And if the government was to spend the amount that was spent in 2009-10 on affordable homes, that would go some way to meet the needs of Londoners. Local authorities, me, the mayor, are doing what we can, but we are frankly speaking struggling with what I'm tied 
pile that back. What would you do differently well, if you were the Prime Minister of our country? You're quite right to request a return to at least the 2010 spending levels in London. That will help to deal with the housing crisis. And as a London MP, I'm acutely aware of the severity of it. A third of my constituents live in the private rented sector, unregulated, expensive, high energy bills and insecure. The housing crisis affects the whole country uh, and it means children underachieve in school, it means worse levels of health, it means all kinds of issues and it's different in different parts of the country. And so what we've said is we would build at least half a million social homes per year on social rent, that is council housing. Uh, which I think is the best way out of this crisis. The problem you face as London Mayor, the problem as council leaders face, is the amount of speculative development that goes on which builds luxury places, uh. sold off plan and kept empty as a land bank for the future. At the same time, knowing full well, every night there are thousands of people sleeping on the streets of our country. Jeremy, thank you. I think we've got a call from someone in uh, North Ken uh, who's affected by uh, the, the Grenfell Tower, knows the community really well, uh, who I know is keen to speak to. Uh, uh, I think we've got Samia on the line. Samia, are you there? Yeah, hi. Good, hi, good afternoon, Samia. Jeremy Corbyn is in the studio. I'll ask your question. Hi, Jeremy. Uh, hi, Samia. It's all good and well. Hi, uh, it's all good and well to say, you know, you're going to reform social housing that's all long overdue and you're going to give residents some powers but what can you do for us now we have a tenant management organization responsible for the death of our neighbors they're still ignoring us they still live with our health and safety and manage our home what can you do now to control them or give us the power to thanks thanks Sammy. Let, 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 let's let Je jeremy respond because obviously time is short jeremy very quickly the royal barroom kensington and chelsea have been appalling and dilatory in their treatment of uh, Grenfell residents and the inquiry took a long time to be set up and is going to get underway one assumes in more detail but you're quite right the issue has to be immediate attention to giving proper secure accommodation to every single one of the Grenfell victims and ensuring that our properties all over the country tower blocks are absolutely safe because clearly Grenfell Tower was not safe now, the treatment that you've received by by the council and by your by your landlord is quite disgraceful and um, my support and sympathy to you <clears throat> excuse me but it's also about what action the government can take on this. Jeremy, thank, thank you very much for your answering and the straight way you answered Asamia's question. The next call, I'm trying to rush through these calls, listeners. I apologize <coughs> if, I'm, if I'm cutting Jeremy short. Uh, but the next call is from Chris from Shaftesbury, and I'm told it's not Shaftesbury in London. Shaftesbury in Dorset. Shaftesbury in Dorset. <coughs> uh, that's my South London geography, not very good. Or, or mm. Central London it's geography. a bit beyond South London, today. <laughs> Chris, over to you, sir. Jeremy Corbyn's in the studio. Oh, good afternoon, Mr. Mayor. Good afternoon, Mr. Corbyn. Hi. Um, um, I was going to ask about um, the, uh, in terms of Brexit, if you were in power, Mr Corbyn, and you had the opportunity to call a second referendum in aid um, the British people to have the final say on a final deal, um, was that something that you would support? What would be your um, opinions on that? What I want to do is negotiate tariff-free trade access to European markets and protection of all the um, regulations we've gained from Europe in, rel in relation to workers, consumers and environment. Uh, the idea that the second referendum is something that many people want, uh, but many are very concerned about because they don't think it would actually solve the issue. I think the issue has to be dealt with by negotiation and by um, a, a meaningful vote in Parliament on what it is. We are in the middle of an Article 50 process, therefore we've declared we're leaving the EU. The question is the future relationship with the EU that we have. I want it to be one where we have an economy that works alongside Europe, not undermines Europe, and we have a trade arrangement that uh, gives us that access. After all, half of our trade is with Europe at the present time. Jeremy, in the first hour we had some <coughs> texts and phone calls from Londoners, and I call them Londoners, who are EU citizens who were just... They, they, they were just very uneasy about their future and uh, can I, I mean how would you you do things differently in relation to the rights of these EU citizens who are they, there's 
they, they work hard, they pay taxes, they contribute to our economy, to our social life, to our cultural life. What would you be saying, to, what are you saying to them? Straight after the referendum, we proposed a motion in Parliament that all EU citizens be immediately granted permanent residence and security and the right to bring their families here as well. That was actually passed with the Conservatives abstaining on it, but it was a non-binding motion. I've said to the government, I've said in Parliament, and I've said to all of our European partners, I want us to guarantee unilaterally all rights of all EU nationals. They contribute to our society, contribute to our communities, and many children in London and other big cities are very stressed. They've got parents, one from uh, somewhere in Europe, one from here, and uh, they wonder what their future is. I want them to realise their future is here, their future is part of our community. Well, Jeremy, thanks, mate. I think you, you couldn't have been clearer. The next, the next caller is from uh, Ladbrook Grove. It's good to see so many yeah. Londoners uh, ringing up. Uh, I think it's Sam from Ladbrook Grove. Uh, Sam, are you there? Yes, hi there, Jeremy. Could you please be absolutely clear what your policy is going to be with tuition fees? As my son and daughter are getting ripped off royally by the current system. Sam, how, how, old, are your, how old are your children? I've got one 18 and one who's uh, 16 coming up to university, and the one who's 18 is having to pay back 6% on his loan when I can get a mortgage for 1.5%. It's scandalous. Sam, thanks for bringing in. Uh, Jeremy? We would end tuition fees for, for colleges and universities and for adult education. We would therefore grant free education to everyone to go through to degree level. We would do that as soon as I'm taking office and had we been elected into office in June they would already have been abolished for this academic year. Jeremy, thanks for the next caller actually, before I bring in Ben who's in Worcestershire who wants to ask about the universal credit I mean, the first three PMQs after uh, recess, you've focused on universal credit and you've already brought about some changing government mm. policy. Can I just tell you, in London, we've had three pilots of universal, universal credit in Croydon, Hounslow and Southwark. More than 2,500 people in the pilots uh, are late with paying their rent because of the delays. Uh, some are facing potential eviction and there's 8 million collectively in rent arrears. So that's just the context before I put through uh, Ben, who's in Worcestershire, to ask a question about universal sure. uh, credit. Should ben, over to you, sir. take Ben's question yeah. first, yeah. Oh, hello, Sadiq. Hello, Jeremy. Hi, Ben. Um, yes, yeah, so I was just wondering, I've seen a lot of debates in the House of Commons where um, MPs both sides are saying they agree with the policy of universal credit. I don't, I'm not sure I do, and I was just wondering if you agree with the premise, because not only is it less than job seekers was anyway, um, I think the wait between, you know, the six-week uh, wait between first applying to getting it, I don't think that's, that's good enough, and it's obviously not helping enough people out of, you know, the situation that they find themselves in. Ben, thank you. Jeremy, can you, can you actually take some time with this one? And, see, and also, can you deal with parliamentary process? Because it seems to me, I mean, since I stopped being an MP, things have changed in Parliament uh, in relation to what happens when votes are won. And, well, we and need, and we when, obviously and need you back. Well, no, I mean, so, so actually, uh, take some time on this one, because actually this is yeah. such an important issue, but sure. also explain the link with parliamentary process and, and explain the vote that took place and uh, the, the, the concessions you've managed to bring about from the government. Yeah. Uh, universal credit has been rolled out so far to less than 8% of the number of people that will finally be put on it. It's been rolled out across the whole country and it will take some years to do. Uh, the dissatisfaction rate is very high already. 20% of those people that are in receipt of universal credit are dissatisfied with the way the system is operating. Many people have gone into rent arrears as a result of it. Many people have been evicted from their homes as a result of it. Many people on universal credit are significantly worse off than they were before. The six-week wait for payment has been met by uh, only 80% of the cases that have been applied for. Therefore, that suggests to me that 20% are waiting more than six weeks for money. Landlords don't wait six months for money, Absolutely. six weeks for money, or eight weeks for money, or anything else. They want it straight away, particularly in the private sector. What we've done is um, a number of things. One is I 
pointed out that the helpline charges of up to 55 pence per minute to phone the DWP to ask about a universal credit were absolutely appalling mm. and astonishingly high. Uh, a week later, the government uh, recanted on that and cancelled the charges. They, in fact, had an income of, I think, £20 million pounds from uh, call charges over the previous year. The second point we did on parliamentary process was we called for the pausing of the rollout to examine the whole thing for the points exactly that you've made, Ben, about the number of people that are worse off under universal credit as well as the numerous inefficiencies in the system. Pilot. The pilot is you have a pilot and then if it's not working, you just improve it. If, but, uh, exactly my point. Yeah. If you've got a pilot and you find that 20% um, of it is not working and yeah. I would thought that's the reason and enough that's the London to, experience by the way. That's the reason enough to pause it and um, go on and do something do something else or at least look again at the whole system. So we put this motion to Parliament to do it. The Conservatives seem to be in denial about all this so they decided that their bold initiative was to abstain on what they see as the, one of their flagship policies. And so what we did was created a vote by two Labour MPs objecting to the motion in order to ensure there was a vote in Parliament. 299 MPs from all parties voted, uh, all opposition parties that is, voted for the pause. Nobody voted against that. That is the will of Parliament. The government is saying, well, it was an opposition motion, therefore it's not binding. This is well, what, this I think when you understand. elect somebody to Parliament, yeah. you expect them to take decisions. This is what people understand because there's a big discussion about... Our Parliament being sovereign and yeah. MPs having more powers and then being relevant, particularly when you think about Brussels and Strasbourg. Parliament decides <laughs> on a motion, it passes, and yet the government ignores it. Indeed. And this is the one of the great failings of our parliamentary system. There are many good things about it, but that's a great failing, which is that the government can and does ignore motions passed on an opposition day motion. Now, when you were in Parliament, Sadiq, and when and Labour was in government, if the opposition put up a motion, we would vote on it, usually to amend it or something else, but we would always vote actually, on it. What we've now got is this non-participation. I, 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 actually, we'd have the humility to accept defeat and change policy. The Gurkhas was a classic example. Uh, and so, you know, you, even with big majorities, uh, the executive should have the humility to recognise when Parliament has uh, spoken to There's loads more calls and the next one is one that's really, I know you feel very strongly about, as indeed uh, I do. Uh, it's on mental health, I'm hoping. It's uh, Nathaniel. Nathaniel, over to you, sir. Oh, good afternoon, Sadiq. Good afternoon, Jeremy. Good afternoon, Nathaniel. Uh, to talk to you as a young person who got engaged in politics by you. Um, Jeremy, he means uh, you, not me, by the way. Well, you're younger than me. <laughs> <laughs> you got him engaged. Um, so it's 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 um, the main point is about mental health. Yeah. I was affected by this. I lost my dad six years ago when I was twenty, and I lost oh, my sorry. job as a result of struggling to be able to cope uh, with his passing. Um, I want to know that basically, if uh, which I reckon we will, if Labour gets in, what will you be able to do to protect and safeguard people who are getting caught up by this? Uh, because it's a really important matter, and I think unless you've been down that route, not many people understand just how harrowing uh, depression is. Nathaniel, let, let me pass over to Jeremy, but before I do, to do so, thank you for your bravery in ringing in and raising this issue. Jeremy, over to you, sir. I absolutely agree with you, Sadiq. Nathaniel, thank you for what you've said, and thank you for the way you've put it. It's a tough thing to talk about, but well done you. There's so much that needs to be said and done about mental health. One in four of us, a quarter of us, are going to suffer some kind of mental health problem in our lifetime, stress or stress-related. If we admit it, go to a doctor, talk to a doctor about it, and recommends us to get supportive treatment, talking therapies, then we expect to get that support and treatment straight away. If you wait six months for that treatment, you're likely to get worse, not better, and too many people sadly take their own lives even during that period. Then it's the biggest the, cause of male deaths under the age of 40 or was it under 50. In, indeed, it is the biggest yeah. cause of male death at the moment is, yeah. uh, is mental health. And for young people, it is dreadful because there is a stigma attached to mental health. There are awful remarks made about mental health. There are horrible jokes made about mental health. And young people feel very alone and isolated. I have been to schools and talked to them about the support that they need to give. But above all, the helplines they need to give and the way of talking about it. But I say to every young person, and every other person for that matter, mental health can affect any of us. Reach out to people that are suffering, talk to them, support them, and help them. And we in turn, a Labour government, would 
guarantee the reality of what is in the Act, which is parity of esteem between physical and mental health. We would see it as a priority to get treatment immediately. We'd see it as a priority to fund it in education particularly and also say to employers in workplaces, have some kind of system that can help people going through stress and don't mark it down against their future career options and opportunities if they've um, ha come to talk to you about stress-related issues. Luciana Berger and I, when she was doing uh, the job of mental health sh uh, shadow spokesperson, went to see a number of companies about this. <coughs> some do it very well, some do it very badly. Barbara Keeley is working very hard on this subject at the moment. Well, can I say, Jeremy, I mean, uh, uh, we've set up in London Thrive London, which yeah. is an idea I nicked from New York, if I'm honest, which is a movement of employers, universities, hospitals, politicians coming together to raise uh, awareness and me and my staff deputy mayors executive directors have all been on a mental health first aid training course well, because uh, because and it's about leadership here and so uh, i'm sure nathaniel and his family and his uh, friends and those who have experience of people suffering mental ill health will appreciate the leadership but that you're showing we need to work further on it the emergency provisions are often not available sometimes somebody that needs to get a uh, emergency bed for mental health treatment it's so far away family and friends can't visit or even worse sometimes they end up in police stations yeah. or end up in an A&E department they don't need to be in the in the care of the police or the A&E they need to be in the care of mental health professionals who can treat them in the way they need to be treated thank you uh, Jeremy the next call out we've got loads of calls as call us uh, Jeremy uh, is uh, also from London which I, I, I hugely welcome <laughs> it's uh, Jim from Pimlico Jim what's your question or comment to Jeremy Corbyn yeah uh, hello Siddiqui hello uh, Jeremy hey Jim uh, Jeremy uh, if it weren't for the Democratic Unionist Party I believe that you would be Prime Minister if you are elected Prime Minister would you introduce an independence bill from Ireland and briefly why I ask this is uh, all of the parties have sat together in coalition uh, in the assembly in Belfast and I believe that they could do the exact same thing in a uh, free parliament in Dublin. They could all sit together and even go into uh, coalition. Jeremy, should I say, I, mean, I, I, I was speaking to some Welsh uh, colleagues and they were telling me that they've say, they faced over the last period a billion pounds worth of cuts from central government and guess what the magic number is mm, for yes. the amount the DUP are receiving as a consequence <clears throat> of being uh, in bed with the Tories, just a billion pounds I'm, I'm, mm. uh, but well I would, I would see you to Jim's <laughs> Theresa May's magic money tree found a billion pounds straight away for the DUP and uh, couldn't find any money for m mental health or any money for nurses' pay or so much else. And so I think we can see where the priorities lie. Well, I, I listen to what you say, Jim. The Good Friday Agreement, the Belfast Agreement, was an enormous step forward. It was an agreement between all the parties in Northern Ireland. It was an agreement on power sharing and it was an agreement on recognising the traditions of both communities. It's within the Good Friday the agreement to, <clears throat> to debate the future of uh, Northern Ireland and its future relationship with the Republic of Ireland and I think that's where that debate should take place the people of Ireland must decide Jeremy thanks uh, as ever for the direct answer to a direct uh, question I'm just picking up there's loads of calls which I want to take I think, I think Barry uh, who's uh, in Albington has a question for uh, Jeremy Barry over to you sir Hello, hello, Barry. Hello, Mr. Mayor. How are you? I'm I, think, I, think, so I think you're Barry. Five, five minutes to go, Barry. So, so far, OK. Over to you. My, my, yeah, not by sorry. I'm a little bit nervous and my voice is a little bit broken. Um, this is actually um, a question for both of you, if possible. Mr. Mayor, uh, I just wanted to ask you, who was it who said Jeremy has already proved that he is unable to organise an effective team and has, has failed to win the trust and respect of British people? Throughout this referendum campaign and the aftermath, Jeremy failed to show any leadership we desperately needed. His position on the EU membership was never clear and voters didn't believe him. Mr Mayor, were you wrong to say this? Do you believe Jeremy on his promise to end student debt and renew Trident as well, basically? Well, wow, 17 questions in one barrier. Well done. Uh, uh, but listen, let me deal with that directly. Uh, we had a leadership contest in our party and uh, uh, Owen Smith stood against uh, Jeremy uh, and the magnanimity of uh, Jeremy when he defeated Owen is to put him in his shadow cabinet. And Jeremy is not the first Labour leader to give jobs to candidates who stand against him, nor is he the first Labour leader who stands in an election and wins it and brings on board his team, uh, defeated candidates, but those who supported the other candidates. And if you can't have a frank discussion during a leadership contest, which is something that the Tories didn't do, 
then when can you have uh, a discussion about the policies of each uh, candidates? And, uh, you know, I'm not just saying this because Jeremy's here, but he's shown during the snap election, Theresa May called this year. And the only reason for Theresa May to call that election when she's 20 points ahead is to try and wipe out our party uh, and not because she wanted a better mandate for uh, the Brexit. Um, and so, you know, Jeremy showed that we weren't wiped out, but also made significant uh, uh, gains. But Jeremy, I'll let you answer Barry's uh, question. Well, Barry, thanks for your question. <coughs> I led our party during the EU referendum campaign on a policy of remain and reform. I believe the EU needs reforming, needs a, quite a lot of uh, fundamental change, but I did say we should remain. Two-thirds of Labour supporters voted with me on that. Sadly, we didn't win that referendum, so we're now where we are on this. My job is to lead the party. I'm very proud to lead the party, very proud of our growth in membership, very proud that in the general election we gained three million more votes than we got in 2015, the largest vote in England since 1970, biggest swing to Labour since 1945. I'm proud of that, but very, very sad that we didn't quite win the election because I want to deal with housing, with mental health. I want to deal with the grotesque levels of inequality and injustice that exist in Britain. I want to lead a government that can bring about this huge social change, revolutionary social change that Britain so desperately needs. That's what we exist for the, in the Labour Party to achieve. And it does mean that after an election process, and I've been through two leadership elections, you've obviously got to work with all your colleagues. And that is exactly what we're doing in Parliament. And I'm travelling the country to go to every marginal constituency we've got to win in the next general election. I've been to 52 since July, and I'm going round all of them. We are going to take it on, take on the Tories. You know what? We're going to win. Jeremy, thanks for that. Can I, can I ask you my question? Which, sure, which, which is, sure. Look, I mean, uh, one of the things about... So you're, I mean, you're Sadiq from this, London, this are Sadiq you? Sadiq from Tutin. <laughs> which is, look, I mean, you and I could both <clears throat> agree on many of the things that we think Theresa May is getting wrong uh, as the Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. And you, you know, are across the dispatch book every, every Wednesday and you have debates and stuff. But there must be th something you admire about her. There must be some, you know... The, it, positives in Theresa May as a, as a human being. I mean, I mean, because people think we politicians hate each other, different parties and different tribes, and, and we mm. can never get on. But one of the things I've tried to explain when I do assemblies and meet young people is, look, we may disagree on policies, but we can find the space, I hope, to be magnanimous, but also give credit where it's due for the other side's, you know, Good points. Um, Does she have any good points? Do well, uh, I don't do personal attacks on people because I, d I think it just diminishes everybody and diminishes politics as a whole. Uh, under demand, um, Theresa May did bring in or support the bringing in of the Gender Recognition Act. She, of her own volition, has done a lot of work on modern-day slavery, and I agree with that, and I, and I support her in doing that. I disagree with her on many issues. I personally do not get involved in this kind of abusive politics, and you, I will always stick to that because it just diminishes us all. You look at another person, you agree with them or you disagree with them, you look for the good points in them, you recognise other points in them, you recognise differences, but try and put your own case. And that is what I'm trying to do. And can I ask you, the, well, I, got a, I got a second question. That's, that's the, one, yeah. of the, one of the things about being, what, being, being what, James O'Brien. Sadiq from Tutin gets two yeah, questions. Yeah. So. Uh, which is, look, we, we, I'm sure you did, I did, watched her conference mm. speech. Uh, mm. I mean, what was going through your mind when she was, when she was doing her speech? And... I don't. You, you you know. What's your response to her speech and how, how you know? A conference speech is a very very tough thing to do. It is. Uh, something that is forensically examined by a very large number of people. Every single thing you do is noticed and is seen to be right or wrong in the eyes of others. And somebody losing their voice, having a coughing fit. Indeed, I had a bit of a cough earlier myself because my throat was very dry. Um, you just have to have some sympathy with that. I think we should uh, look at what people's political objectives are. I fundamentally disagree with the political objectives of Theresa May. Obviously I do. I put out our case, she puts out our case, her case, and what's more, there'll be an election at some point soon. This government is unstable, it's divided, I can't see it lasting. Jeremy, thank you so much for coming into the uh, studio uh, to speak to listeners across the country to answer my questions, but also 
you know, I think I think what you said about the way we do politics is so important because young people in particular are watching the way we conduct ourselves, whether it's PMQs, whether it's uh, the debate we're having here or across the country. I'm going to let you have the final word because uh, it's really important that we, uh, you know... Everyone has a view, everyone has an idea, everyone has an opinion. We can all learn something from each other. And so I, when I travel around, I talk to lots of people. I talk to homeless people, I talk to managers, I talk to all kinds of people all the time. And you know what? You learn some kind of philosophy from all of those. I remember the death of an old friend of mine in my constituency. He was a building worker and he died. And in his retirement, before he died, he did lots of good for other people. And his house, quite honestly, was very sparse, very bare kind of property. And somebody went to him and said, Jim, why do you live like this? He said, I live simply that others might simply live. A philosopher. Ladies and gentlemen, that was uh, Jeremy Corbyn. You've list been listening to me, Sidney Khan, and uh, Jeremy Corbyn. Coming up next is uh, Sheila Fogarty. Thank you very much, everyone.
with regard to, to far right or totalitarian 